from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello again, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast. This is Alyssa Carroll, and I am your host and the creator of at serial underscore killing on Instagram, where we go through the life stories of serial killers to see if we might catch a glimpse of why they displayed their famous vile and disturbing behaviors. This week's podcast will be on the infamous Dennis Nilsson. Dennis Nilsson was born on November 23rd, 1945, making him a Sagittarius, and he was born in the coastal town of Fraserburgh, Scotland. And as we always do, let's see what was going on in Scotland at that time. Now, as a side note, it was surprisingly difficult to get at least moderately interesting history about Scotland in 1945. So, though I have friends in Scotland, they didn't get back to me quite in time. So, this portion will be a little bit shorter. I do apologize for that. So in 1945, at this point, there had been a global war going on for six years. Now we know this war as World War II. As the war was coming to an end, it was estimated that over 50,000 Scottish soldiers had died. The end of the war signaled a renewed hope and determination to build a better UK. During the war, normal competitive football was suspended in Scotland due to the war. Many footballers signed up to go to war, so the Scottish Football League and the Scottish Cup were suspended and regional league play was allowed. The Scottish National Party won its first parliamentary seat but then lost it again six weeks later. In a couple of years after Dennis was born, the very first Edinburgh Festival was held. So looking at what things cost at that time, the average price of a house in Scotland in 1945 was about 620 pounds or $804. In today's money, that's 24,800 pounds and that You can't buy a house for that, so things were excruciatingly cheap back then, but the average salary was 214 pounds or $277, which in today's money is only 8,551 pounds or $11,091. No family can live on that. So needless to say, prices were a lot different compared to what we pay for things now and what the salaries are now. So in 1945, there were 4.7 million citizens of Scotland. And in 2012, it rose to 5.2 million. Dennis Nilsson was the second born child out of three. His siblings' names were Olav and Sylvia. His father was Olav Moksheim and his mother was Elizabeth White. Now Olav Moksheim was originally from Norway. He had been a soldier there and traveled to Scotland after the German invasion of Norway in 1940. He adopted the surname Nilsson once he was in Scotland. Olav and Betty met outside of a cafe and they quickly married in 1942, although Betty's parents were not particularly happy about this marriage. Betty White was raised in a devoutly Catholic household, and she stayed very much religious. The couple lived in her parents' house, and Olav never really began to even try to find or buy a house for his new wife and their now growing family. Dennis and his siblings were conceived when Olav would, on rare occasion, stop by to visit his wife. Dennis's father just didn't seem to want to be bothered with the responsibility of having a family. 
He had a serious drinking problem and spent most of his time out and away from his family. He and Betty eventually divorced in 1948 when Dennis was three years old. Olav ultimately returned to Norway. Betty later admitted that she had rushed into the marriage too quickly without really thinking. So Dennis's earliest childhood memories were of spending most of his time with his maternal grandfather, Andrew White. He looked up to his grandfather tremendously, though Andrew was described as strict, sullen, and proud, and due to his staunch religious beliefs, he looked down on people who consumed alcohol and worked on Sundays. One of Dennis's favorite memories of his grandfather were him riding atop his grandfather's shoulders or them walking together up and down the beach for long periods of time. Even at just five years old, Dennis recalled perfectly these memories and said that at that time, he was completely content with his life, having really no memory of his biological father. Dennis stated that he, his siblings, his mother, and grandparents would go on picnics out in the country. But when his grandfather had to go back out to sea to work as a fisherman, Dennis said that he would feel completely empty until his grandfather returned. So Andrew's health was declining, but he insisted on continuing to work. And on October 31st, 1951, Dennis's grandfather got in his boat and headed out to the North Sea to fish. While out there, he suffered a major heart attack and he unfortunately died. He was 62 years old. Dennis was just almost six. His grandfather's boat was found along with his body and it was brought back to land to be given to the family. Andrew was put in a little wooden casket and was on display in the family's home before the burial. Dennis's mother, nearly inconsolable, told him that his grandfather was home and would he like to see him. And when Dennis told his mother that he would like to, she took him into the room that his grandfather's body was in and he saw his grandfather's corpse laying in this wooden casket. Dennis later stated that this is his most vivid childhood memory. He said he remembered that his heart was beating wildly in his little chest and his mother told him that his grandfather was not dead, that he was just merely sleeping. So this, guys, this was the moment where Dennis fully admitted that his idea of love and death became intertwined. So little Dennis quickly internalized his complete and utter devastation that his beloved grandfather was gone. He went from an adventurous and curious young child to being quiet and reserved. He stopped wanting to be involved with his siblings and most of his free time was spent standing on the very shores that he and his grandfather endlessly walked up and down together. He simply stood there and just stared out into the sea for hours watching the fishing boats. He at first tried to convince himself that his grandfather was indeed still alive and out at sea, but as the months went by, he could no longer deny it. Due to his family's deep religious beliefs and customs, there just wasn't a lot of physical affection or attention given to him, but when his mother did try to hug him, he would shrink away. Dennis withdrew from people and turned his love to animals. He later stated that he never had a healthy and loving relationship with anyone after his grandfather was gone. So one day, nine-year-old Dennis was again at the beach, watching the boats and was waiting around in the water. And somehow he got sucked underwater and was nearly dragged out to the open sea and he did what anyone would do. He began to panic and scream for help. He was waving his arms desperately. But then he later stated that a feeling of complete tranquility flooded him and he began to believe his grandfather was coming to rescue him. However, his rescuer was another young boy who saved him and brought him back to shore. 
Not long after this incident, Betty, his mother, met a local builder named Andrew Scott, and she went on to marry him. They then had four of their own children. Dennis said that Andrew was a strict disciplinarian and he resented him as a young boy because he felt that his older brother and his younger sister were treated better than he was. His brother, Olav, was popular amongst the other local kids, so Dennis often played with his younger sister, Sylvia. In 1955, when Dennis was 10 years old, they moved to Stryken which was about eight miles inland from his hometown. Now, Dennis began keeping pigeons as pets, and at some point, some vandals killed every one of those pigeons for no known reason, and he was yet again left completely devastated. As his mother and stepfather continued to have children, Dennis felt more and more isolated, feeling that they had no time for him. Now there is a story about how Dennis had found an injured sparrow one day. So he created a little nest in a desk drawer and he fed it fish that he chewed up in his mouth first before feeding it to the bird. You see, he was an animal lover to say the least. He never exhibited rage or cruelty to other children, either that is usually seen with other people who grow up to be serial killers. Dennis displayed no conduct disorder behaviors whatsoever and was in fact horrified when he saw any bullying or hurtful treatment of anyone at any time. As Dennis reached the beginning of puberty, his mother and stepfather's constant preaching about the quote, impurities of the flesh, affected him as well as his growing realization that he was attracted to boys instead of girls. He found himself attracted to boys that resembled his younger sister, and so he thought, oh, well, maybe it's because I love my sister so much that this is why I'm feeling this attraction to boys. He didn't dare share his feelings with what few friends he had or any of his family, and he felt a lot of shame. Once he had an impulse that he felt he needed to act on, and so he did touch his younger sister inappropriately but he didn't feel what he expected to feel. So he moved on to touching his older brother sexually while Olav was sleeping. And though Olav wasn't entirely sure Dennis had done this, he suspected it and he began to also suspect that Dennis was gay. So Olav began belittling Dennis publicly, calling him a hen, which is Scottish slang for a girl. And as Dennis continued through school, he made good grades and he was considered quite intelligent and he never caused a fuss or acted up in school. But he was becoming increasingly aware that Stricken was not a place that he wanted to stay. It was a small town with very little to do and not a lot of jobs. Though he was aware of and proud of how much his parents worked and sacrificed for their children, They were still fairly poor, and Dennis was embarrassed about what little they had. So, what few friends he had, he never invited over to his house. Dennis once told a story about how, as an early teen, he had been sexually assaulted by another older boy, and he said that that experience was, quote, not unpleasant. At 14 years old, he decided to join the Army Cadet Force, believing that joining the British Army was going to be his ticket out of there. And in 1961, at just 16 years old, Dennis enlisted for nine years service in the military and was sent for training with the Army Catering Corps at the St. Omer Barracks in the far south of England. Here, he began to learn to be a chef, and he excelled in his duties and became a skilled butcher, which would come in handy later. So that's Dennis's childhood in a nutshell. I couldn't find any additional information about his biological father after he returned to Norway, such as if he ditched the Nilsson last name and went back to his original last name or not, or if he had remarried and went on to have other children, I just could not find that information. But it is reasonable to assume that he did, at least eventually. So 
We begin Dennis's life with an absent father, which could very well have affected him negatively. But we already know his maternal grandfather stepped right in as a positive role model. So I believe the loss of the father that he barely even knew and basically had no memory of shouldn't have affected him on any real deep level. Now, I could be wrong. I'm definitely not an expert. His grandfather was hardworking. He provided for his family. He was stable. He spent loads of time with Dennis walking the beach and talking about all manner of things. So I feel that up until his grandfather died, he was okay in the father figure department. No one from his past describes him as being different or maladjusted in any way before the incident where his grandfather died. There were no behavioral problems reported whatsoever, but we do know that he was deeply affected by the death of his grandfather. We also know about him nearly drowning at nine years old. Now another boy saved him, and I'm inclined to think that Dennis didn't suffer any physical harm from this incident. Now, there are some sources that say that when Dennis woke up after being saved, that he had a quote, and this is graphic, a white sticky substance on his stomach as if the boy who saved him might have pleasured himself over his body while he was out. Some sources don't mention that at all, but I wanted to throw that in there because I think that if it did happen, it certainly pertains to his later crimes. There was also no mention of the other boy having to perform CPR or Dennis having water in his lungs or any of the sort. So I'm going to assume that his brain did not suffer any real effects from oxygen deprivation. So together we can set aside any defects or physical trauma that might have happened to him, at least up to the point of the death of his grandfather, at least with what we know with his early life now. Dennis was six years old when his grandfather died, and we've already established that they had a very close bond. So let's explore that. Children are quite vulnerable to psychological problems after the loss of a parent, a sibling, or another family member that they had an intense bond with. According to the U.S. National Library of Medicine, the impact of trauma in children depends greatly on the life stage during which the event occurs. Psychiatrists and others have been surprised by how often major childhood loss seems to result in psychopathology. Studies have been conducted of adults who have various mental disorders, especially depression, often have had serious loss of a loved one during childhood and going through the bereavement process. This suggests that that level of loss may precipitate or contribute to the development of a variety of psychiatric disorders and that the experience itself can leave a person emotionally vulnerable for the rest of their life. This special vulnerability of children is linked to developmental immaturity and underdeveloped coping mechanisms. So in order for the mourning process to be considered complete, air quotes, at least in the true psychoanalytic sense of the child going through each phase and ending in acceptance, the child must have some understanding of the concept of death itself. And this is where the chronological age of that child comes into play. Since Dennis was six, or not quite six, he falls kind of in between two stages. Stage one is about very young children and toddlers. They believe the death is reversible, that the dead are just, quote, less alive in a kind of permanent sleep state. Stage two is for very young children to prepubescent kids. They are able to comprehend the finality of death, but they believe it actually only happens to other people, not them. So the immediate effects on a child when dealing with the death of someone very close to them are that they will withdraw, they'll have difficulties in concentrating, they might have sleep disturbances, restlessness, and learning difficulties. But it is not noted that Dennis had learning difficulties or sleep disturbances, but he did definitely withdraw. 
The intermediate effects show that some of these children will continue to show signs of depression and continued emotional distress. The long-term effects show that intense childhood bereavement can lead to vulnerability during adulthood that could then lead to neurosis, psychosis, physical illness, schizophrenia, and antisocial behavior. It is not to say they developed these symptoms spontaneously, but rather, if the propensity was there, the intense feelings from the loss could bring out what might have stayed dormant, if you will. They also have a higher rate of being hypochondriacs, which are people complaining about ill health as adults when there really isn't anything wrong with them. So the big picture is that young children that have to work through the loss of a dearly loved person, usually a sibling or a parent, and in Dennis's case, his grandfather was his substitute father, they don't truly understand that the person is actually dead or at least cannot process what death really means. Then as they get older and into adulthood, they are much more likely to suffer with serious mental illnesses, most likely severe depression. Now, when you throw in the fact that his mother actually told him that his grandfather wasn't dead, that he was just sleeping and was in a better place, that did not help matters whatsoever. Young Dennis was forced to look at his grandfather's corpse. This man, he idolized and loved above all, and then was told the corpse was just sleeping. You see where this could create an issue. So remember this as we continue. Another thing I want to add to this is that children who have to work through and heal from the death of a beloved person can and often turns into negative feelings about themselves. They will interpret the death as being desertion by that person because the person didn't love them and they begin to believe that they are unlovable, which of course starts a persistent feeling of low self-esteem. They could be terrified of abandonment later in life and have an intense need to be cared for. This is also something you need to remember as we go on with Dennis's story. So let's get back into the story. Dennis, by now in the army, was popular amongst the other soldiers and found true camaraderie. Of course, never fully admitting to himself or anyone else that he was gay. He thought perhaps he might be bisexual. And then he went through a phase where he thought he might be asexual. Also during this time, he began to drink with his army buddies and he quickly began to drink heavily. Being a chef in the military meant that he had the ability to travel and cater extravagant parties. He even had the privilege of catering a ceremonial parade that hosted the Queen of England herself. So those first few years in the military were, as he described, the happiest of his life. But as he had always pushed his sexual orientation down and he never addressed it, it was now beginning to surface. He didn't dare let his fellow soldiers know how he was feeling. He even refused to shower around any other men because he was afraid that his body would, quite frankly, respond to seeing the other men and they would notice that. In 1964, Dennis was 19 years old, he passed his catering exam and was immediately stationed in West Germany. While there, he began to drink alcohol more and even described himself as a, quote, hard-working, boozy lot. Mostly he did this to help him with his social anxiety, but one night in particular, Dennis and a young German lad drank excessively, and Dennis woke up on the floor of this guy's apartment. Now, he knew immediately that nothing sexual had happened between them, but this was the beginning of his sexual fantasies of having a completely submissive or passive young slender male as a sexual partner. And those fantasies quickly changed from having a passive partner to having an unconscious or dead partner. Now, who does that sound like, guys? There is a reason why Dennis Nielsen is compared to the famous Jeffrey Dahmer. <laughs> 
So after two years of being deployed, he returned to England, but then was sent to Norway to cook for the British Army. And in 1967, when Dennis was 22 years old, he was sent to the near southern tip of Yemen and was assigned as a cook at the Al Mansour prison. While there, he was given a private room that happened to have a full-length mirror. And with this new privacy, he began to pleasure himself in front of the mirror, only he would lean where his face was not quite in the reflection. And this elevated his fantasies even more where he would pretend his body was a dead body. He even began toying with covering his body in talcum powder and he would use coal to make his eyes look very dark underneath. He would darken his lips so that he would appear to look like a dead body. During his time in the military, he picked up photography and immediately loved the hobby. He loved it so much, in fact, that he would gather up his army buddies and ask them to lay on the floor and pretend that they had just been shot and were dead. He would take pictures of them, he would develop the pictures and hang them up in his room. Now the other guys played along, but behind Dennis's back, they started talking to each other about how he acted so very different. They did suspect that he might be gay. Dennis continued to drink heavily with his fellow soldiers, but after the incident, when he woke up on the floor, he had already decided that he would not get, quote, blackout drunk anymore. But he would, however, lay there and pretend to be passed out in the room with another man, hoping that that man would take advantage of him, but it just didn't happen. The other soldiers would also go out and pick up prostitutes, and Dennis would go with them and act like he was into it, but would usually excuse himself to leave, and he would tell them he was tired or too drunk to perform. He did, however, sleep with a female prostitute once, and though he was able to get through the act, he described it as, quote, overrated and depressing. At one point, Dennis was kidnapped by an Arab taxi driver. The man beat Dennis until he was no longer conscious. He then put Dennis into the trunk of his car. Once the car stopped, the man opened the trunk to find Dennis holding a tire iron. Dennis beat this man until he was unconscious and locked his ass in his own trunk. So there's that. One of Dennis's favorite art pieces was a 19th century painting called The Raft of Medusa. And it's pretty interesting, I suggest you Google that. In the lower left corner of this painting, it shows an older man on a raft with many other people. The old man is holding a nude, dead young man's body. And beside the old man, to the old man's right, is another young man's dead and what appears to be dismembered body. Dennis envisioned the old man washing the body of the young man he had pulled onto the raft and then having intercourse with it. Then, just before he left the army, he met Brian Masters and they became very close friends. Dennis knew he was in love with Brian, but he also knew that Brian was not gay. He was, however, able to convince Brian to lay down and act dead while Dennis took home movies of him. But once they were forced to part ways, Dennis was so upset he destroyed the films that he had made with his friend. But finally, Dennis left the service in October 1972 after serving for 11 years, and he went home to Scotland to see his family. It didn't take long for his mother to voice her concerns about why Dennis wasn't dating or had a girlfriend. His older brother, Olaf, began stating what he had always suspected, that Dennis was homosexual. To his devoutly religious family, that idea was completely unacceptable. Dennis was devastated that his brother had outed him like that and he never spoke to him again. He took a job training to become a police officer for the Metropolitan Police in London. He barely even kept in contact with his mother over the years. And by the time he moved to London, he was 26 years old.
Once Dennis was a policeman, he soon found that he was well suited for the job. He had a need for complete control and this job afforded him the opportunity to feel that regularly. He was detail oriented and got along with his co-workers, but he did miss the camaraderie from the army. So part of the job of being a policeman entails having to go to the morgue and see dead bodies, which Dennis found fascinating. But after a year of being a policeman, he decided to resign and he went on to be an acting executive officer at the employment office in Soho where he stayed. That summer at night, he began going to the local gay bars and started having frequent hookups with other men, but he wanted a connection, not mindless one night stands. Dennis later described this chapter in his life as soul destroying and a quote, vain search for inner peace. During the day, he was a quiet and mannerly civil servant who volunteered to work overtime, but there towards the end, he also called out of work on occasion. He was still painting his face and body to look like a corpse, even making fake blood as he became concerned that he was in love with his own dead body, as he later put it. By 1975, when he was 30 years old, he was ready to be in a committed relationship. He also moved into 195 Melrose Place in North London. It was a ground floor apartment and it had a small yard. And just before moving in, he saw a small feminine man being threatened outside of a bar by two big burly guys. Dennis broke it up and he took 20 year old David Galishan to where he had been staying. And he found out that David was gay and had no job and was currently swapping from hostel to hostel. They agreed to live together in the apartment on Melrose and together the pair decorated the apartment. Since David didn't have a job, Dennis thought of himself as the husband of the relationship and he let David do with the apartment and landscape the small yard as he pleased. They also began occasionally sleeping together, but Dennis always emphasized that they very rarely ever had sex. The pair also went and adopted a border collie dog and they named it Bleep. They named it that because when they adopted it, it was small and it didn't have a big bark, but it would rather make a small squeaky sound, thus Bleep. But Dennis absolutely adored Bleep. He fussed over him as if he were his child. And if you are curious, you can go to YouTube or Google and see actual home movies of Dennis and David with Bleep. So after a year of domestic bliss, the couple began to argue frequently and the relationship soured. They then began bringing their one night stands home. The fighting escalated until David said he was done and he left. This devastated Dennis. Not since the death of his grandfather had he felt so abandoned and upset. He drowned his sorrows in booze and more sexual encounters, meeting men at the gay bars. By 1978, he was isolating and withdrawing into himself again. He convinced himself that he was, quote, not fit to live with. Then on December 30th, 1978, Dennis met 14 year old Stephen Holmes while Stephen was trying to buy alcohol. He invited him back to his apartment, telling him that he could drink with him there. Dennis later stated that he thought that the boy was 17, but he was only 14. The two drank together and they eventually fell asleep. The next morning, Dennis woke up to find Stephen asleep in his bed with him. And he became scared that when Stephen woke up, he would leave him. He began caressing the teen's body and he told himself that he was going to stay with him over New Year's, whether he liked it or not. He grabbed a tie, he strangled Stephen until he was nearly dead. He then drowned him by holding his head in a bucket of water. Dennis then took the body to the bathtub where he washed it lovingly, carefully pleasuring himself over the body and he put it in his bed, pulling the covers right up to his chin. 
He liked that the body was still warm. You see, Dennis didn't actually want to kill the boy. He simply didn't want him to leave. It wasn't the murdering that he got off on. It was the not wanting to be alone. So much like Jeffrey Dahmer. He was so lonely and he just wanted to make someone stay with him. But once the body began to cool, he decided he would try to have sex with the body. Only his own body would not, let's say, cooperate. So he pulled the body onto the floor, he covered it with a curtain, and he went back to bed. Once he awoke from a long nap, he made himself some dinner and watched TV. Bleep was sniffing the body, and Dennis shooed him away. He finally decided to hide the body under his floorboards, where he left the body for eight months. He then started a bonfire in his backyard, and he burned what was left of the body, along with rubber from old tires, to mask the smell. Once everything had burned to ash, he took the ashes and spread them over the grass into the ground. So, at first, Dennis was scared that he would be found out, but after he realized that he had gotten away with it, he vowed he would never kill again. But that lasted for 10 months. In October 1979, he met a young Asian student by the name of Andrew Ho. He met him at a pub, and Andrew agreed to accompany Dennis back to the apartment. When Dennis tried to strangle Andrew, Andrew broke free and escaped and contacted the police. They interviewed Dennis, but Andrew didn't want to press charges, so the incident was dropped. Again, so similar to Jeffrey Dahmer. In December of 1979, 23-year-old Canadian native Kenneth Ockenden was touring England and visiting relatives. He stopped in at a West End bar to have a drink where he met Dennis Nilsson. Dennis found out that he was a tourist and offered to take Kenneth around to show him some famous English landmarks and Kenneth gladly accepted. After, he took Kenneth back to his apartment after purchasing more alcohol and they began sitting around and listening to music. Dennis was thoroughly enjoying Kenneth's company and he began to dread what he knew was inevitable. As Kenneth was listening to music through headphones, the big 70s headphones with their long cord, Dennis grabbed that cord connected to the headphones and he strangled Kenneth with it to death. He then dragged his body across the floor. He sat down himself and listened to the music coming from the headphones that had just been on Kenneth's head. He then removed the clothes off the body he took it to the bath, lovingly washed it, then put the body in his bed and slept with it all night. The next morning, he put the body in a cupboard, threw away the clothes, and proceeded to go to work. Upon his return, he washed the body again, dressed it, and sat it in a chair. He started snapping several pictures of the corpse. He then put the body back in his bed, and he let's say performed necrophilic actions with the body but again he swore that there was no actual penetration and once he was done he put him back under the floorboards understand that Dennis took that body back out of the floor and repeated those steps for two weeks can you imagine a body for two weeks so after this, Dennis began killing more frequently. By the end of 1980, he had killed another eight to 10 young men. He was most attracted to smaller, slim, feminine looking men, and he had a knack for finding transient young men that were happy to come home with him with the promise of food and a bed to sleep in. Once he killed them and could no longer play with the bodies due to bloating or the smell, he would place them under the floor but during the summer months, the heat would attract insects and the smell would become unbearable. He would spray insecticide over the bodies as well as putting scented objects like maybe little scented trees down under there to try to cope with the odor. In 
But finally, he knew the smell was garnering attention from his neighbors, so he took an old tire and laid it in the yard and burned the six bodies along with the tire to try to, again, mask the smell. Once everything was reduced to ash, he raked through the ashes, spreading them around in the grass, making sure there was nothing left. And if there were bones, he would crush them with the handle of the rake. Finally, during the summer of 1981, the landlord of the apartments that Dennis lived in wanted to renovate and he asked Dennis to vacate. He gave him 1,000 pounds to do so. The day before he moved, he had a final bonfire burning another two bodies that he had stowed beneath the floor and using an old tire to cover the smell. He then went around thoroughly making sure that there were no trace of any evidence and when he was satisfied there wasn't, he moved into the attic apartment at 23 Cranley Gardens. Knowing that he could not hide any bodies in the floor here because it was an attic apartment, nor did he have any yard to burn the remains in, but not being able to stop bringing men to his apartment, he was actually able to keep himself from murdering for two months. But then Dennis met John Howlett in a bar and got him to follow him home with the promise of more alcohol in a movie. Later, John got drowsy and he went into Dennis's bedroom and got in bed falling asleep and effectively passing out. Dennis began trying to strangle him, but John fought back and had his own hands around Dennis's throat. For a moment, Dennis thought that he would be overpowered, but finally John became unconscious. Then he would begin breathing again, and Dennis would have to try to strangle him again, and this happened a couple of times, and Dennis got really frustrated, and he filled his bathtub with water, and he drowned John in it. The next year, Dennis lured 21-year-old Carl Stotter, who was gay, back to his apartment, though with the promise that nothing sexual would actually happen. Carl drank until he passed out in a sleeping bag on the floor. He awoke to Dennis strangling him. He went unconscious. He awoke again as Dennis was trying to drown him. Dennis then put Carl in a chair and Bleep, the dog, began licking Carl's face. Dennis realized that Carl was alive, albeit barely, so he tried to revive him and he covered him in blankets. And once Carl was conscious and recovering, he was actually forced to stay in Dennis's apartment for two days, and he asked Dennis what had happened to him. Dennis told him that he had become trapped in the sleeping bag, and he had to put him in the cold water to wake him up because he had gone into shock. Carl knew better, but he was scared. He just wanted to get out of there. He let Dennis escort him to a train station, and Dennis bid him farewell. There is an interview with Carl Stotter on YouTube if you are interested in looking that up. Dennis's next victim lay dead in the bathtub for three days before he dismembered him on the kitchen floor. His last victim was a 20-year-old suicidal young man who had fresh marks on his wrists from a recent suicide attempt. After having his time with the body, he dismembered it and tried to get rid of it by cutting it up into smaller pieces and flushing it down the toilet. But in an odd twist, Dennis wrote a letter to the owners of the building and said that the plumbing at the apartments were blocked, making living conditions unbearable. So the landlord called a plumbing company to come and take a look at the pipes on February 8, 1983. The plumber found flesh and bones in the drains where the blockage was. He told his supervisor who said that they would come back the next morning and investigate. Dennis commented to one of the other tenants that, you know, well, someone must have been flushing their Kentucky Fried Chicken. As absurd as that is. The next morning when the plumbers returned, the drains had been emptied. However, there were still little pieces of flesh and bone in the piping that led up the side of the building. They immediately called the police and the remains were taken to a mortuary where a pathologist analyzed them and told the police, guys, these are definitely human remains. 
the police went to the apartment building and waited for Dennis to get home from work. And when Dennis returned, they all entered the apartment and immediately the officers recognized the odor of rotting remains. They directly asked him where the rest of the remains were and Dennis, very calm and collected, replied that the rest were in two plastic bags in the closet. He was immediately arrested and taken to the station. And without hesitation, Dennis confessed to everything. When asked why, he said he didn't know and that he desperately wanted them to tell him why. He gave them the gory details of how he treated each body after he murdered the victim, and I mean gory details. Dennis stated, quote, I wish I could stop, but I couldn't. I had no other thrill or happiness, unquote. Dennis was charged with murder and he pled not guilty by diminished responsibility. The one victim that survived his attack, Carl Stoddard, testified against him in court and it was emotional. Dennis was ultimately found guilty on six counts of murder and one attempted murder and was given life imprisonment. Then almost a year after he'd been in prison, he was given a Glasgow smile which is a cut from the corner of the mouth up toward the ear on each side of the face. Think of the Joker. Other inmates had permanently scarred Dennis's face. Those slices required 89 stitches. As the years went on while he was in prison, Dennis translated books into Braille. He liked to read, he enjoyed writing, he even painted and composed music on a keyboard. And he also generally responded to letters that he received. But after complaining of stomach pain in May of 2018, he underwent surgery, but he died from a blood clot on May 12th, 2018. So we're talking just a little over a year ago. So what was going on with Dennis? There were actually two psychiatrists that worked with Dennis during his trial. Dr. James McKeith testified that Dennis suffered from a lack of emotional development. He stated that Dennis had treated his victims not as human beings but as components of his fantasies. He also described Nelson's association between unconscious bodies and sexual arousal, stating that Nelson possessed narcissistic traits. He also had an impaired sense of identity and was able to depersonalize other people. His conclusion was that Nilsson displayed many signs of maladaptive behavior and all of these factors attributed to an unspecified personality disorder. The second psychiatrist was Dr. Patrick Galway who diagnosed Dennis with quote borderline narcissistic personality disorder with occasional outbreaks of schizoid disturbances that Dennis managed most of the time to keep at bay. Galloway stated that someone suffering from these episodic breakdowns is most likely to disintegrate under circumstances of social isolation. So coming from someone who's not an expert like those two, I feel that Dennis lost his grandfather who died out at sea at an age where he couldn't fully process the loss. His mother told him that his grandfather was not dead, but asleep and also in a better place, which I think confused the young boy. He loved his grandfather completely. Then not long after, he nearly drowned And as he began to accept his fate, he thought he could see his grandfather coming to save him. So then when you fast forward to his fantasies and his later murders, he wanted a completely submissive and preferably unconscious victim. He restricted their airways and some he drowned in buckets or in his bathtub. And this all goes back to the death of his grandfather, as well as his near death experience with drowning. Was he subconsciously trying to recreate these two pivotal moments in his childhood that had had such a dramatic effect on him? What do you think? Leave me a comment on Instagram at Serial underscore Killing or YouTube under the same name of this podcast. 
you can visit my website at serialkilling.squarespace.com and also consider sponsoring the podcast. It takes many, many hours and a lot of work to gather this info for you, though I do love it. And thank you so much for listening. I appreciate each and every one of you as I know you could be listening to anyone else, but you chose me. Have a great day. Music by Kevin MacLeod on Incompetech.com.